Okay, so we are back and we were looking at this modified modus ponens rule which works with first order formulas in the implicit quantifier notation and is a one step process. So, earlier we said first you have to do universal instantiation then you can do modus ponens. Now, we are saying in one step you can do this modified modus ponens which has inside it built a uh, substitution that you are allowed to substitute uh, variables with some values and that of course, will also solve the problem of the guesswork that we were talking about as to what should you instantiate x to. Here, because we know that you are going to match it with p of a, uh, we simply say that okay, we want a unifier for p of x and p of a. When I say p of x, I am not mentioning the question mark, but whenever it is an x, it is a variable and uh, we go forward and infer uh, q except that in q also we will have to apply the substitution which is x with a. So, we get q of a. Let us look at an example of that. Um, so, here is a formula alpha which says that tennis is a sport. So, here is a formula alpha which says that tennis is a sport and Alice likes tennis. And then we have a rule which says that if something which is we are calling y, if y is a sport and if x likes y, then x watches y. From this we want to infer that Alice watches tennis. It seems um, sound enough. So, what we do is we find a unifier. So, alpha unifies with beta. So, we want to unify the antecedent of the rule with the fact that is given to us and the unifier is replace x with Alice, replace y with tennis and that we get an instance of that rule and then we can do the modus ponens uh, in the same steps this thing and infer delta theta which means you apply theta to this and x is Alice. So, so, x goes to Alice and y goes to tennis and we have made this inference essentially. Much easier to implement rather than do the two step process that we were talking of earlier, which also involved a guess. See rules in, in the real world uh, may have conjunctions as antecedents. It is not that p x implies q x, but it could be p 1 x and p 2 x and p 3 x and p 4 x implies q x or there may be other variables also. How do we handle that? So, supposing this is what is given to us that p, p of x y and r of y implies q of x and then we are given that p of a z, a is a constant and r of z. Can we infer q of a? That is a question. Now, that is a rule that is uh, uh, the rule that is given to us is has a conjunct inside it essentially. But what if the facts that were available to us were individual facts? Okay, let me not write here. These are the facts. What does the fact like P is question mark z mean? So, the fact itself is a universal statement. It says that for all z p a z whatever the p does, but for all z that is true and the second one is saying for all z r z is true essentially. So, there can be facts like that, that every number is smaller than its successor for example, in, in number theory. But if we had these two separate facts, then we would have to first use the rule of conjunction. Remem remember that this proof is an entirely syntactic process uh, this thing. So, first we would have to generate the conjunct formula and which is of course, we have this rule of conjunction which says that if you have two facts, you can alpha and beta, then you can say alpha and beta is a fact. If you have a fact alpha and if you have a fact beta, then you can say alpha and beta is a, is a formula this thing which you can add to the knowledge base. So, once you add that, then of course, you can use our good old rule which had the conjunction and, and infer q of e essentially. But 
perhaps what one could also do is that one could allow this to be itself a rule of inference which says that uh, if you have conjuncts as antecedents and if you have those constituents of the conjunct in available independently, so this is available independently, this is available independently, the rule should be able to do it in one step. Again, we do not want to introduce that extra step of having to use the conjunction rule essentially. Okay. So, that is a small optimization we can do when we are writing programs essentially. So, now that we have this modified modus ponens, you can see that we have a shorter proof for our Alice problem. Uh, it is as long as it was when we looked at propositional logic, we do not have the universal instantiation step anymore. Instead, what we have is the use of modified modus ponens, which has a built in matching uh, unification process involved essentially. So, this algorithm of finding the unifier is called unification. We will look at that. But before we look at the algorithm, let us look at uh, a few facts about formulas which are which have variables in them, universally quantified variables. We say that a sentence alpha is more general than a sentence beta if there exists a non empty substitution lambda such that alpha lambda is equal to beta, non empty substitution that is an important word. Uh, you cannot like we do in set theory and, and other regions of maths, you could say strictly more general than or you know more general than includes equality, but let us not get into that. So, we will assume that when we say more general than, we assume that it is strictly more general than essentially. So, it is just like saying a, 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 a set A is a subset of itself, we do not want to say that essentially. So, when we want when you say it is more general, we mean it is more general which means that there is a non empty substitution lambda. So, here is some examples. Um, everyone loves a good teacher is more general than everyone's dad loves a good teacher and it is also more general than Suresh loves a good teacher. So, the first one everyone loves a good teacher as you can see simply says that if x is a good for all x if x is a good teacher then for all y, uh, y loves x essentially everyone loves a good teacher. The second one says that for all x, if x is a good teacher, then dad of y. Now, remember we had said that the arguments to predicates in first order logic can only be terms, which means dad of y is a term, it is not a predicate, it is a function essentially. So, obviously, everybody has a unique that, so we can define a function like that. Uh, and now we are saying that this one is uh, uh, also this is also a valid rule. If everyone loves a good teacher, that means everyone's dad also loves a good teacher because everyone's dad is part of everyone anyway, essentially. But in the last example, it's clearly more general because in the last example we are saying Suresh loves a good teacher. In the first sentence, we are saying everyone loves a good teacher, so that is obviously more general essentially. We can now talk about a generalized universal instantiation, which so earlier we said that you can substitute an x with a constant a essentially. So, now we are saying that you do not need to do that, you can even you replace it with a function. So, you can go from y to something which is which uses a function inside it essentially of y. Because y says every y in the domain, and this one is also pointing to something in the domain or the other, so it must also be true essentially. So we know this notion of general more general than now. So now let's look at some inferences that you can make in forward chaining. So we have two facts here. Everything we can talk of everything as a fact. Some people distinguish between facts and rules. Uh, a rule is something which has an if then component. So, the first fact here is a rule, the second one is a fact. We will use the term interchangeably. They are all sentences in your knowledge base. Some of them are facts, some of them are have this conditional uh, implication essentially. So, the first fact says or the first rule says that if y is greater than or equal to z, then z is smaller than or equal to y. 
So, that is just finding a relation between greater than and smaller than that they are opposites of each other essentially. That is one fact, uh, one rule essentially. The second fact says that x is greater than that everything is greater than equal, equal to 0 essentially. Hmm? For all x, x must be greater than 0 or x must be equal to 0 and which is the relation greater than or equal to that we have defined here. What can we infer from these two facts? We have said that if y is greater than z, then z is smaller than y, greater than or equal to and then we are saying that x is greater than 0 all the time. So, one thing that we can infer as you can see is the following. We can say that this x is 7, it is a valid uh, substitution. We can also say y equal to 7 and then we can say z equal to 0 and then you can see that the antecedent of the rule will become identical with the second fact that has been given to us. So, the, they will respectively transform them into uh, if 7 is greater than 0, then 0 is less than 7 and the second one will say 7 is greater than 0. And therefore, of course, we can make an inference that 0 is smaller than or less than 7 essentially. But we can use another substitution. This is a smaller substitution. It is uh, says that replace y with x. That is allowed. Okay. The value can also be a variable. There is no restriction on that. So, this second one is saying replace y with x and replace z with 0 and what do you get? You get that 0 is smaller than or equal to anything. It is also a valid inference. It is got from the same rules. This kind of a unifier is called the most general unifier and one way of looking at it is that uh, uh, the conclusion that it produces is more general than the conclusion that it produces from a more specific unifier. Most general unifiers are useful uh, because the inference that we make is the most general conclusion that you can draw and from there you can simply use the rule of universal instantiation to derive the actual thing that you might be interested in. So, if you are interested in talking about 0 and 7, you can say for that what is the relation between 0 and everything else and then say okay, that also whole applies for 7 because 7 is one of the numbers in the domain essentially. So, let us quickly look at the unification algorithm. So, what does the unification algorithm do? It takes two or more formulas as input and returns the most general unifier for the formulas. When you say returns, it computes essentially. Let us say we are working with the list notation. Uh, then there are three kinds of elements in our uh, in in our formulas. Uh, they can be lists, or they can be constants, or they can be variables. Essentially. So basically, predicates will go as list, functions will go as list, formulas with logical connectives will go as list. So only the most atomic units terms, the most simplest of terms will be constants or variables essentially. So, we should basically build up our substitution by looking at the structure of the two formulas that we are trying to match. Now, you can observe that two constants can only unify or match if they are identical. You cannot say uh, that 7, 7 unifies with 8 you know, because both of them are constants. The only way they can unify is by saying that 7 unifies with 7. So, if one formula has 7 and another, the other formula has 7, then you can go ahead and unify that essentially. Two lists, two lists are unified element by element. So, you first of all they must be of the same length, then you compare the first element, second element, third element and if all of them unify, then you can say that we have unified the two lists. So, we scan the two lists simultaneously and build up the substitution. Now, a variable can match any other variable or it can match any constant 
or it can match any list okay so by list is a general uh, structure that we are talking about here uh, it can match a so a variable can match another variable a constant or a list but we will see that there is a restriction that the list must not contain the variable essentially one thing you have to be careful about universal formulas universally quantified formulas is that because you are writing this program to do this uh, you must be careful to use different variable names in different sentences even though semantically it is not required it's not necessary semantically because look at these two sentences that we have the first one says if 7 is greater than equal to x then x is smaller than equal to 7 the second one says greater than or equal to everything is greater than or equal to 0 essentially and in both the cases we have used the variable name x now obviously there is nothing wrong in that uh, because essentially what both are saying for all x here for all x here they are simply saying that for every x you can think of it is true the second one is also saying that for every x that you can think of it is true but when when we get around to this process of finding unifiers and all we run into a problem here because if you have used x in both the formulas then you cannot substitute x both with 0 and 7 so the uni the substitution must have one value for the variable x so should you put 0 or should you put 7 neither will help you what you need to do is to not use those same variable name in two formulas so the solution is rename variables so every time you write a new formula you will use variable name you can use x1 in the second one x2 in the second three third one x4 in the third, and so on you must just use different variable names essentially and then there is no problem because if you have replaced now x and z as the two different variables now you can see that you can unify z with 7 and unify x with 0 and everything is fine essentially mm -hmm. so one one rule cardinal rule that you must do if you are writing programs to uh, do forward chaining uh, or in fact any other form of reasoning is that you must standardize variables apart essentially you know, every formula must use a different variable name because even though the formula is universal um, the two formulas are independent of each other ok so the algorithm unify it returns the mgu mgu is the most general unifier and it takes two the algorithm unifier takes two arguments arg1 and arg2 and it returns the mgu so we are writing algorithms in a functional style where it's a function which will return something to you what it does is to call another function which is called sub unify by adding a third argument now this is a standard practice you must have seen in many places and the idea of the third argument is to build the substitution theta piece by piece as you are scanning the two formulas or maybe even going uh, uh, looking at the nested formulas because you no know, list can have nested lists and so on as you are doing this whole traversal uh, you are constructing the substitution piece by piece uh, we need some place to hold that substitution and that is what the third argument is meant to do and of course we initialize it at the empty list because initially we do not have anything so our initial call to sub unify would be the same two arguments that we unify has but we have added an empty list to that as a third argument and that empty list is where we will hold the substitution remember that the substitution is a collection of uh, variable value pairs and as and when we find a value for some variable we will add it to that list so sub unify in some sense is the main thing uh, what does it do if arg1 and arg2 are both constants then they must be equal otherwise you return some failure message we have used this nix i think this nix was used by charniak and mcdermott so i am also using that if arg1 is a variable then you can call another algorithm called where unify the the thing about where unify is that the 
first argument to where unify will be a variable and the second argument can be anything of course. So, if arg1 is a variable as we have said here call where unify. In a similar fashion if arg2 is a variable again call where unify, but this time arg2 has come as the first argument to where unify. So, the first argument to where unify is a variable. If we have reached this point that that neither are they constants nor are both of them variables then they must be lists essentially and then we first check whether the length of the two lists are the same. If they are the same then for each corresponding element of the two lists now remember arg1 and arg2 are lists by this point we call sub unify recursively building up the substitution theta as you go along. So, the last piece is algorithm where unify the first argument is a variable the second argument can be anything and theta is what we are building up as we go along. So, the first check that we must do is that if variable exists in the arg variable is the first argument arg is the second argument if variable is inside that arg this thing then you cannot unify that. If variable has a value already in theta, so what is the value? The, some variable called pattern and this is in theta. Then we sub unify those two things the arg that we were trying to unify and the pattern that it is already unified with. So, then you must be able to make them the same. If variable is already equal to arg, then you do not do anything. Finally, we augment theta by adding this pair variable arg. What is variable arg? Variable is the arg are the two in inputs we gave to this program and then we add it to theta. So, we take a union if you are thinking of theta as a set. Now, the first point if variable exists in argument then return nix and here is an example which says why you, you should do that. Supposing you are trying to unify x with plus x 1. So, plus is a let us say it is a function which stands for addition uh, then you cannot unify this x with this with this pattern essentially because if you if you say substitute x with plus x 1 then there is that x inside what do you do with that do you keep substituting infinitely we do not want to get into that sort of a thing it does not make sense also. So, we will simply say that if x if x exists inside the pattern then return nix say that we cannot unify this. Okay. So, here is so that was the basic uh, uh, unification algorithm that we have studied. Uh, it is a general algorithm it does not necessarily apply only to first order logic for any kind of patterns in which we can distinguish between um, functors and by functors uh, some people refer to everything like function symbols, predicate symbols, logical connectives everything all these can be thought of as functors. So, as long as you can distinguish between functors, functors are things which put two more than one thing together essentially. So, as long as you can distinguish between functors uh, for us the functors are lists here because you know uh, everything is in a list notation. So, as long as you can distinguish between functors and variables and constants this algorithm will work for unification essentially it is not specific to first order logic. Okay. So, what we have done here we set variables constants uh, and but there were some other kinds of constants involved here which was scolum constants that we talked about uh, and scolum constants are used in the implicit quantifier notation only when the existential quantifier is not in the scope of some universal quantifier. What if it is? We will look at that in the next set.